The hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Good morning and welcome to our day's hearing on extreme weather. Uh, this is a topic that I think is universally relevant. As many of my colleagues and, I'm, and our constituents have dealt with extreme weather events recently. In fact, NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information found that in 2018 alone, the U.S. experienced 14 climate weather and disasters with losses for each toppling $1 billion. These events included drought, severe storms, wildfires, tropical cyclones, and winter storms. And they impacted nearly every state in the continental U.S. As of July 2019, the U.S. has already experienced six weather and climate events with losses greater than a billion dollars each. In July 2019 was also the hottest month on record worldwide, which led to record low levels of sea ice in both the Arctic and Antarctic. There is an increasing scientific consensus that human-driven climate change is playing an undeniable role in many of the extreme weather events that we have experienced. Earlier this week, the World Meteorological Organization of the UN released a report that found that climate change through the slowing of the jet stream could be directly linked to the record-breaking heat waves experienced across North America, Europe, and Africa in 2018 and 2019. There was also clear evidence that the jet stream pattern influenced many extreme rainfall events as well. Yesterday, the IPCC released a special report on the oceans and cryosphere. It identified up to 90% of the marine heat waves from 2006 to 2015 were due to climate change. Climate change was also responsible for the increased precipitation winds and extreme sea level events associated with some tropical cyclones. The special report also determined that some back-to-back -back extreme weather events that we have become accustomed to seeing have also been influenced by climate change. I know many of my colleagues from the Houston Gulf Coast area have directly experienced these impacts with extreme rainfall that they saw from the Hurricane Harvey two years ago. And most recently, they had a deal with Tropical Storm Imelda, which dropped to over 40 inches of rain in some parts of Houston just last week. This hearing is especially timely, given not only recent extreme weather events such as Dorian and Imelda, but also because September is National Preparedness Month. It is important for our constituents to understand how they can and should be preparing for disasters, including extreme weather. It is vitally important that the public can rely on official forecasts from the National Weather Service to inform their responses to weather events without worrying that these forecasts have been interfered with. Though our ability to forecast the path of a storm like Hurricane Dorian has greatly improved, our dedicated meteorologists and the National Weather Service still cannot say with absolute certainty that the intensity of a storm like this will be. These track forecasts have relied heavily on satellite observations. And any interference with the data in these observations, such as weather vapor measures, could have dire consequences for communities that lie in the path of a similar hurricanes. We have discussed in this committee the importance of sustained observation to feed into the weather models that are used to develop forecasts and the need to continually be improving those models and subsequent forecasts. I expect today's hearing will be no different. But in addition to the need to continue to support the physical science observations and modeling that goes into developing forecasts, there is also a need to understand how to better integrate the social and behavioral sciences in our weather enterprise. 
More research is needed to understand how our biases can impact the forecasting process and how our past experiences with extreme weather events can influence how the public interprets forecasts and notices from emergency managers. With that, I'd like to extend my welcome to our very distinguished panel and thank them for joining us this morning. We are looking forward to a robust discussion on how this committee can help our country better prepare for future extreme weather events, events that we are likely to expect more frequently and intensity due to climate change. At this time, I recognize our ranking member, Mr. Lucas, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, for holding today's hearing on extreme weather, an important topic within our committee's jurisdiction. Extreme weather events are of concern to us all. Regardless of what part of the country we represent, these events represent threats to lives, property, and often occur with little warning. The economic toll of extreme weather events across the nation is significant. The most recent National Climate Assessment stated 241 incidents with more than a billion dollars of economic damage since 1980, including 14 such events in 2018 alone. I want to make my position clear. The climate is changing. Global industrial activity has played a role in this. The complex relationship between climate and weather is in need of continued research, and this committee has a responsibility to prioritize that research if we want America to be a global leader in this field. That should be the focus of today's hearing, not outright denial or finger pointing on inaction. There are many components as we examine how best to research and respond to extreme weather, including how we help communities prepare for these events, how we improve our weather forecast, and how we communicate the possibility of an extreme weather event to our citizens. This committee has taken steps to help address these issues. The Weather Act signed into law in 2017 directed NOAA to improve its tornado warning capacities and hurricane forecasting capacity two of the most destructive types of extreme weather events. Additionally, the legislation required NOAA to perform an assessment of its practices on communicating extreme weather events to the public. NOAA has made progress in implementing these provisions in the last two years, but much work remains. A Weather Act reauthorization was signed into law in January. Included in the legislation was congressional authority of NOAA's Earth Prediction Innovation Center commonly known as EPIC. This initiative will make the National Weather Service's numerical prediction models available to the academic community for crowdsource forecasting on a larger scale, which in turn will help improve our national forecasting ability. Oklahoma is no stranger to extreme weather events. Whether it's an outbreak of tornadoes, severe droughts affecting our farmers and ranchers, or extended cold weather, we've seen it all. Thankfully, Oklahoma is home to one of the world's most renowned experts in the field of weather research and forecasting. The National Weather Center is located on the University of Oklahoma campus in Norman and houses federal, state, and university researchers in a collaborative environment. Among the federal offices in the Weather Center are NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory and Storm Prediction Centers. These offices are the leading edge of researching and forecasting the outbreak of extreme weather events across the country. Additionally, Oklahoma is home to the nation's premier weather mesonet. A mesonet is a series of small weather stations spread out across a large area which help monitor real-time conditions on the ground and provide citizens and forecasters with vital data. This data helps farmers determine the optimal time to plant, and can alert emergency responders if conditions are ripe for developing a tornado. As this committee considers possible legislative initiatives based on today's hearing, we should look at the Oklahoma Mesonet as a model for how we can improve the forecasting and communication of severe weather events. Our panel of witnesses today bring diverse perspectives on researching all aspects of extreme weather events. I thank them for taking time to be here, and I look forward to a productive conversation on this important topic. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Our first distinguished witness is Dr. J. Marshall Shepard. Dr. Shepard is a leading international expert in weather and climate and is the Georgia Athletic Association 
distinguished professor of geography and atmospheric sciences at the University of Georgia. Dr. Shepard was the 2013 president of the American Meteorological Society. He is also the host of the Weather Channel's award-winning show, Weather Geeks, and a contributor to Forbes magazine. He was the first African-American to receive a PhD from the Florida State University Department of Meteorology. Our second witness, Dr. James Doan, is a senior Willis Fellow and Deputy Director of the Capacity Center for Climate and Weather Extremes at the National Center of Atmospheric Research. He works with shareholders from the energy, water, and insurance sectors to understand future weather and climate extremes and their impacts. Dr. Doan received his PhD in meteorology from the University of Reading in the UK. Our third witness is Dr. Adam Sobel. Dr. Sobel is a professor of Columbia University's Lamar Doherty Earth Observatory and the Few Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and leads the Columbia University Initiative on Extreme Weather and Climate. He is an atmospheric scientist who specializes in the dynamics of climate and weather, particularly in the tropics, on time scales of days to decades. Dr. Sobel earned his PhD in meteorology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The chair now recognizes our ranking member, Lucas, to introduce our fourth witness, Dr. Moore. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. And Dr. Baron Moore is a director of the National Weather Center and dean of the College of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences at the University of Oklahoma. Dr. Moore is an internationally recognized earth scientist who's been honored by NASA, NOAA, and multiple international organizations. He received his Bachelor of Science in Mathematics degree from the University of North Carolina and his PhD in Mathematics from the University of Virginia. He was the coordinating lead author for the final chapter of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, third assessment report. As such, has been honored for contributing to the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize awarded to IPCC. Back in March, I had the opportunity to visit the National Weather Center while in Norman, and I was lucky to receive a tour from the director himself. You might say I'm biased, but I believe these facilities and the researchers there are the best in the world. This is a testament to Dr. Moore's continued dedication to make the United States the gold standard in weather prediction. And in recognition of his lifelong work in weather science, he's been uh, the recipient of numerous honors, including NASA's Distinguished Public Service Award, NOAA's Administrator Recognition Award. He's also uh, an elected fellow of the American Meteorological Society and the International Academy of Aeronautics. Thank you uh, for making the trip here today, Dr. Moore. And thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Our final witness is Dr. Ann Bostrom, is the Weyerhaeuser Endowed Professor of Environmental Policy at the Daniel J. Evans School of Public Policy and Governors at the University of Washington. She studies risk perception, communication, and decision making under uncertainty in context of weather change, hurricanes, earthquakes, and tsunamis. Dr. Boston co-chaired the National Academy Study Committee, integrating social and behavioral sciences within the weather enterprise. She holds a PhD in public policy analysis from the Carnegie Mellon University. So thanks to all of you for being here. And as witnesses, uh, you should know that each will have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you uh, have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions and each member We'll have five minutes to question the panel. We will start with Dr. Shepard. I would like to thank Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and colleagues on the committee for this opportunity to share my thoughts on the contemporary extreme weather and its context within a changing climate. In 2013, I sat before the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee on a similar topic, and there's nothing that I would change about what I say today from what I said then, except to amplify the message. 
NOAA recently updated what constitutes a 100 or 1,000 year flood in Texas because the rainfall is changing. This has implications for the National Flood Insurance Program and infrastructure design. Tropical Storm Imelda and Hurricane Dorian join Michael, Harvey, and Maria as extreme events that either rapidly intensified, stalled, or inundated regions. Was it caused by climate change has become a very popular question, but it's an ill-posed question. Extreme weather attribution must be carefully considered and framed without hype, speculation, and social media debates. In 2016, I served as a co-author on a study by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine on attribution of extreme weather events in the context of climate change. A key finding is that we are able to, with some degree of attribution, to link climate change with some degree of confidence, moderate to high. The fingerprint of climate change is imprinted on the intensity or frequency of contemporary heat waves, extreme rainfall, drought, and to some degree hurricanes. There is little to no confidence in attribution of tornadic storms at this time, but the research continues. Let me stop right here and emphasize, yes, 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 climate changes naturally and always has. It's often amusing when people remind me, a degreed climate scientist, of this fact at dinner or on social media. But it's not an either or proposition. It's an and proposition. Grass grows naturally, but it grows very differently when we fertilize the soil. In 2018, there were $39 billion plus disasters. According to insurance broker Aon, insured dollars total $90 billion, which is the fourth highest inflation adjusted number of such events. And of those events, the United States had 16 of them. We must message these events as kitchen table issues and challenges to our water and food supply, public health infrastructure, and national security. It's not about polar bears in the year 2080. Hurricane Michael devastated my home state of Georgia. Hardworking Georgia farmers lost pecans, peanuts, and cotton. But guess what? Americans buy peanut butter and buy t-shirts. They felt the impact too. Now I want to quote from a book that I read, Ecclesiastes 1.7, all streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. This text perfectly captures the water cycle that we all likely learned about in fourth grade. And we know that water is essential to life and doesn't understand the concept of liberal or conservative. Yet the water cycle is changing, more extreme downpours, melting snowpacks, and overwhelmed stormwater infrastructure. So what do we do to move forward? We have to keep observational and modeling capacity robust. Challenges with rainfall forecasts from tropical dep depression of Belda and intensity changes with Michael affirm the need for the EPIC framework that was mentioned. The National Center for Atmospheric Research and NOAA and other partners are moving out on EPIC, and I believe it's a positive step to ensure a nimble and responsive U.S. weather modeling capacity to make our weather models the best in the world for forecasting the zero to 14 day range and at seasonal time scales, we need the fastest supercomputers available to accommodate the emerging volume of observational data from NOAA, NASA, and global partners. NASA is implementing its decadal survey uh, recommended by the National Academies. NOAA is funding underwater gliders at the University of Georgia, Georgia to help with hurricane intensity forecasts. But the best forecasts are bad forecasts if people don't interpret them. So we need continued investments in social sciences, which we need to understand risk. And because there are vulnerable populations in our society that because of social status, uh, elevated uh, health risk, et cetera, are more vulnerable to these events. It's been unprecedented. And, and in fact, we're in a new era of extreme weather. So we've experienced deadly heat. We've seen the devastating floods from recent hurricanes, Harvey Florence, and just last week, Tropical Storm Imelda, as we mentioned earlier. And we've experienced the tragedy of fast-moving, intense wildfire. So what's causing these changes? Well, the impacts from extreme events are due to characteristics of the weather events themselves, but also due to characteristics of what's in harm's way. So now into climate change, a growing and per pervasive risk multiplier. 
So sure, our rising populations have uh, contributed strongly to our rising impacts. But as a physical scientist, I can see that the events that cost money, such as flooding rains, have increased. So as we saw the images of um, Hurricane Dorian uh, recently, uh, that just showed the um, potential for catastrophic intersection between uh, a record-breaking weather event and our rising population shown there in the night lights. So given that today's atmosphere is warmer and more moist than it used to be, it's, it's inconceivable that today's weather has not changed. Indeed, our droughts are hotter, wildfires are larger, and our heavy rain events are even heavier. So what of the future? So one or two degrees temperature rise sounds fairly small, but the impacts are expected to be anything but. So we expect the rains to become even heavier. Most hurricane scientists will tell you they expect faster winds, heavier flooding rains, and more expansive storm surge inundation. Now consider wildfire. So already, California is already one of the most flammable regions on Earth. The aspect of climate change we understand most on wildfire is the impact of a warming atmosphere. It demands more moisture out of the vegetation. This desiccated vegetation leads to more intensely burning wildfires that are fundamentally of a different character to the ones we see today. Now, the US has world-class science and technology. So this includes sponsorship of the National Center for Atmospheric Research by the Nas National Science Foundation. But we lack a uh, key understanding of the most damaging events. And perhaps more importantly, there's a disconnect between our advancing science and societal benefit. And in this area of changing extremes, it's more important than ever to have solid, well-communicated short-term forecasts and robust risk management strategies. So I believe there's uh, huge gains to be had by a deep integration of our advancing science with risk management. So allow me to give you, give you a, an example from my recent experience as a Willis Research Fellow. I collaborate with the reinsurance industry. So through our interactions, I learned that hazard risk commonly assumes that these extreme events don't know about each other. But I've seen that in the data that some events they're like uh, buses, you wait for ages and then three come along at once. So scientists are excited to know how this can advance uh, forecasting and risk managers are interested in designing away this vulnerability. So my second example comes from building codes. Some work I did with economists showed that for every dollar you spend building to code, you can expect two to eight dollars back in reduced losses. So this is clearly sound economic policy. And it was demonstrated to dramatic effect as when Michael last year, we saw um, homes that were not built to code were completely destroyed. Homes that were built to code suffered relatively minor damage. So to pursue this deep integration of science and risk management, the federal government has a vital role to play. So the new NOAA and NCAR Community Weather and Climate Modeling Partnership, together with the um, EPIC, really it serves as a model for how this should happen. It directs science squarely in the needs of society. And in terms of bolstering the science, um, as was mentioned earlier, we need to sustain our resources for continued observational platforms, such as the Oklahoma Mesonet, sustained computational infrastructure, the creation of a national data set of extreme events, and also sustained research grants to analyze and develop understanding. So in conclusion then, let me reiterate the importance in this new era of extremes for solid, well-communicated short-term forecasts and robust risk management. So thank you again, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Sobel. Madam Chair, Ranking Member Lucas and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. I'm Adam Sobel, a professor and atmospheric scientist at Columbia University, and I have a longer statement that I'd like to submit for the record. Extreme weather is changing due to global warming, but we know, some, we know more about some kinds of events than others. Heat waves are the best understood type of extreme weather event. When any heat wave occurs today, it's probable that global warming made it more likely to occur, more intense once it did occur, or both. On the other hand, we know much less about tornadoes. There have been changes, but we can't yet say with confidence that these changes are caused by warming 
nor what we expect in the future. Most kinds of extreme weather fall in between these extremes of understanding and ignorance. I will focus on hurricanes. Hurricane risk is increasing due to climate change. Storm surge driven coastal flooding is certainly becoming worse due to sea level rise. Hurricanes in a warmer climate also produce more rain and stronger winds, though there is still debate on the magnitudes of these changes and to what extent they're already evident. We know little, though, about how hurricane frequency, or the total number of storms per year, changes with warming. Natural variability makes any gradual human-caused trends hard to detect, and models are inconclusive on this question. Because all other aspects of changes in hurricanes only matter when a hurricane actually occurs, this uncertainty about hurricane frequency limits our ability to predict changes in overall hurricane hazard and risk. But it would be a serious mistake to interpret this uncertainty or other similar uncertainties about exchanging extreme weather risk as license to delay action. Uncertainty is not our friend here. By analogy, imagine the FBI has inconclusive but worrying evidence that some bad people somewhere may be planning an attack. These people are having a meeting, and the FBI has managed to plant a microphone in the room, but it's noisy, and the bad people are speaking quietly, making it impossible to hear what they're saying. Would we want the FBI to interpret this uncertainty as meaning there's no need to worry? Or would we want them to take whatever reasonable measures they can to prevent the attack, given whatever information they do have? I think most of us would want to take action. <clears throat> the same is true with climate and its consequences for extreme weather. Human-induced climate change is happening. We can't wait until all the uncertainties have resolved. By that point, we will have baked in much, yet much more warming and extreme weather that we could have avoided with earlier action. I'd like to end with some recommendations for timely research to close key gaps in our knowledge. We certainly need continued investment in forecasts of both weather and climate, including the observations, models, and methodologies that enable them. A greater gap, though, is research that quantifies the risks from extreme weather and their changes as the climate warms in terms of their impacts on human society, including economic losses, human health impacts, food and energy security, and so on. In particular, I advocate development of a new generation of catastrophe models, like those used in the insurance industry, to assess risks from extreme weather events, but that go beyond existing industry standards by explicitly addressing climate change as a component of the changing risk, and by being open source and thus subject to rigorous peer review. And I elaborate on this in my written testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing, and thank the committee and your colleagues on both sides of the aisle and both sides of the Capitol for your support for the nation's research enterprise, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions or provide additional information. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Moore. Thank you. Congresswoman, Chairman uh, Johnson, Ranking Minor right, Minority Member Lucas, I'm delighted to be here. I'm Barry and Moore, Director of the National Weather Center and Dean of the College of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences at the University of Oklahoma. My testimony is mine alone and not representative of those organizations. Having listened carefully to my colleagues, I've adjusted my ver verbal remarks somewhat to focus on areas that they did not touch upon, but that certainly does not mean that I'm in disagreement with them. Regarding climate and weather, uh, one may think of it this way, is that one of the great challenges is that some of the statistical properties that we have historically relied upon to help us in our forecasting are being changed. There, there are parts of Oklahoma that you can drive through by just simply looking in the rearview mirror because it is very flat. We are now entering the Rocky Mountains, and looking in the rearview mirror may not serve us well. As a consequence, the numerical weather prediction models are those models that allow us to look forward into time and help us drive the automobile better. Unfortunately, as we all know, and, congressmen, and Congress has spoken about this through the Weather Innovation Act, as well as the Drought Act of last year, uh, bringing into existing the Earth Prediction Innovation Center, 
uh, that we as a country are not uh, doing as well as some of our European colleagues. This is particularly unfortunate given the fact that we as a country seem to be subject to more weather extremes than many other parts of the world. And therefore, that failure of, of us as a country uh, is particularly painful. I'd like to now direct my testimony on three areas. What new observations might we need to improve the situation? And then how can we assimilate those observations better in our numerical weather prediction models to improve our predictive capability? And finally, how do we improve the models themselves? Regarding observations, I think there are three principal topics. First of all, we have a um, very important weather radar system for the United States, but it is an aging weather forecast system, a uh, radar system. The service life expectance has allowed us to extend the life of these radars, but we are going to need a new weather radar system for the United States, certainly by 2040. Well, the implementation of that would certainly take five years. The procurement of that would certainly take five years. So now we're at 2030. Well, we have to have the requirements and the technological base for this new weather radar system by certainly 2028. That's just eight years away. We need to get on with this. Secondly, uh, satellites are extremely important to us in terms of our weather prediction. Uh, the GOES system, the JPS system. But what I see is missing is we do not have a sounder, something that tells us about the humidity and the temperature and the water vapor in the lower part of the atmosphere. I think what we need to do is to fly a hyperspectral environmental sounder. And what we might do is put it on a commercial communications satellite as a hosted payload. This is something that we are exploring in the country. In fact, three of NASA's upcoming missions are going to be via a hosted payload. Thirdly, and Congressman Lucas spoke about this, the national mesonet. This is the gold standard of national mesonets is, is, is in the state of Oklahoma. Every state should have a gold standard. Every state merits the observational network that we in Oklahoma enjoy. And as we look to the future, one of the problems with the National Bezident is it's a ground-based system. As I just said with the hyperspectral sounder, we need a space-based system. But it needs to be complemented by a ground-based system that allows us to look into the third dimension. Certainly, with the increase of drones, there ought to be a way to do this but it's going to require foresight and action by the Congress. Finally, I think that EPIC really does offer us an opportunity, the Earth Prediction Innovation Center, to go forward and improve the data assimilation and modeling by allowing us to marshal the full scientific enterprise of the United States to move on this problem. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much, Dr. Bostrom. Good morning, Honorable Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Frank Lucas, and members of the committee. Thank you for your invitation to speak on the urgent matter of extreme weather events and climate change. I'm Ann Bostrom, Weyerhaeuser Endowed Professor of Environmental Policy at the Evans School of Public Policy at the University of Washington. I teach research methods, decision making, and environmental policy courses, and I work to increase interdisciplinary research on the environment to bridge science and society and to ensure that investments in basic sciences are also benefiting our communities. I've also contributed to National Academy's reports, including Communicating Science Effectively, a research agenda, and I co-chaired with the eminent William Hook the National Academy's 2018 report, Integrating Social and Behavioral Sciences Within the Weather Enterprise. In addition to climate change and extreme weather events, my research investigates other hazards and the perception and communication of what we know and can do about such hazards, as well as scientific and management uncertainties. 30 years ago, in my first studies of climate change risk perception, communication, and decision making, scientists and lay people voiced their expectations of more extreme weather as CO2 emissions from our fossil fuel use warm the planet. Now the scientific evidence is overwhelming that climate change has contributed to extreme weather events in recent years, increasing their severity. 
Despite the phenomenally improved forecasts that government research investments have enabled over recent decades, we have failed to forestall catastrophic damages to many of our communities from hurricanes, floods, droughts, and wildfires. To protect lives and property and to realize the full value of the investments made in the physical sciences, we need to invest in social and behavioral sciences of extreme weather and climate change. People need to know what to do in, when a tropical storm or hurricane threatens. For example, how driving might be affected and how to evacuate. People intuitively understand that there are uncertainties in weather forecasting. They do not, however, always interpret visual and other forecast uncertainty information in the way that forecasters and emergency managers wish or expect. People also tend to be more prepared for an event when they have prior experience of it. But while a plurality of people in the US have long thought climate change will lead to more extreme weather events, their experiences may not be predictive of the weather extremities climate change will bring. Tropical Depression Imelda dumped three feet of rain in 24 hours, which caught people by surprise, despite Harvey. Much remains to learn about how best to communicate forecasts and forecast uncertainties in these circumstances. The careful experimental research that has been conducted to date shows that people can make better decisions if they are given explicit uncertainty information based on the best scientific forecasts and tailored to their decision context. But there is a very large need for additional research on communicating uncertainty for different decision contexts, research that brings social, behavioral, and other scientists together to determine how climate and weather information can most effectively be integrated, analyzed, and delivered to help forecasters, emergency managers, drivers, indeed all of us, make better decisions. The National Science Foundation, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and other agencies appear to be increasing their investments in such research. But to date, they constitute only a very small proportion on the order of less than 10% of their weather-related research investments. These investments have funded pilot programs like the CASA Dallas-Fort Worth Living Lab program, which provides timely, tailored, human-scale forecasts on personal devices and surveys users to achieve continuous improvement. To fully realize these and other life-saving advances on a national and international scale will require scientific leadership and capacity building across the public and private sectors as well. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today on these critical issues relating to extreme weather. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now begin our first round of questions, and I will um, recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, as the scientific consensus continues to show, certain extreme weather events are directly impacted by climate change. But there remains uncertainties in the attribution of climate change and to other extreme events. So my question to all of you, what are the most pressing research needs to better understand the physical processes that drive extreme weather events? Well, I'll start the question and I'll, I'll focus on hurricanes because what we know about hurricanes from an extreme event standpoint is that our, our forecast tracks have improved remarkably in the last several decades where we still lag as in intensity forecast. And, and the reason that is, is basic meteorology. The intensity processes associated with hurricanes involve things happening in the inner core of the hurricane, in the eye wall of the storm, beneath the storm. And so we need observations in those regions the tracking or the prediction of track of a hurricane is governed by larger scale processes. Where's the Bermuda High sitting over the Atlantic? Will that storm uh, be pushed into Florida or North Carolina by that steering current? But that energy release, I often describe hurricanes like a car engine. There's a lot of energy being released in the eye wall as those thunderstorms are arising. And we're not observing those processes. Our models aren't scaled to represent those processes. Uh, I mentioned in my opening remarks, the University of Georgia is testing through some NOAA funding these robotic underwater gliders. And they are actually uh, measuring warm pools, deep ocean water 
that type of information can be very useful in understanding the intensity process. So uh, to your question, Chairwoman, I think in terms of hurricanes, the intensity problem is still a, a, a very large challenge, challenge for us. And I would also say on the rainfall aspect of the hurricanes, we're seeing more rainfall uh, in hurricanes Harvey, Florence, Imelda. Uh, we warn on wind with our Saphir Simpson scale. That's a wind scale. And so I think in terms of the communication challenges that we heard earlier, uh, and it, it echoes with what my colleague said, uh, we need to think about ways to uh, communicating to the public that rainfall and water is what kills most in storms. And so I think there's a combination of intensity and then a communication of risk as we see this new normal in extreme events because past experience with a hurricane doesn't sort of predict your future um, outcome from a new storm because it's a new normal. Thank you. So uh, scientists are on the cusp of something of a re revolution in how we are able to simulate extreme weather events. So uh, in the next two years or so, we expect we'll be able to see these devastating uh, events in very fine levels of granularity over decades. So this really represents a, a transformation in our ability to understand the processes and the, um, the interactions between the weather and the climate. So this um, <coughs> represents um, a new, new horizon of understanding, which should feed into improved forecasts on the seasonal to decadal scales. Uh, I will build upon what Marshall Shepard uh, mentioned it focused on hurricanes, I will fo focus on tornadoes. Tornadoes, And I, I'd like to just observe that uh, we all know the phrase uh, Tornado Alley. That phrase is being replaced these days by Dixie Alley. There appears to be a migration of very large tornadic activity uh, to the southeast. Uh, these tornadoes tend to be larger and they tend to occur at night. Why is this happening? Well, we don't know but we know it is happening. The observational infrastructure of the Southeast presents more difficult situation than in Oklahoma uh, because of the terrain. And yet the observational situation in the Southeast uh, is less dense. So you have a terrain problem with a less than dense observational network, and that's going to need to be addressed. Um, in particular, I think, a national mesonet really needs to be a national mesonet at the standards of Oklahoma, and in fact, maybe have to exceed those in these more terrain-challenging areas. Second, we're going to have to have a radar network that is equal to the task of the 2040s and 2030s, which is, as I mentioned, going to require work now. And finally, I think in the models, not only do the models have to be better in their physical properties, as Marshall mentioned, I think they've got to uh, also build upon a better uh, observation basis of the boundary layer, the lower part of the atmosphere. Thank you, Dr. Russell. Oh, my time has expired. Thank you. Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Dr. Morrill, let's expand for a moment on your comments in your opening testimony and just now about the mesonet system. And for our friends in the room who've never been exposed to it, this is a network of weather data gathering sites all over the great state of Oklahoma. There's what, probably 30, 40, 50 uh, information points from subsurface soil temperature to, to wind to a variety of things. And it is fully accessible to everyone, correct? Yes, and it's well over 100. Well over 100 sites. So can you discuss for a moment, teeing off of what you've said about the challenges in other parts of the country, about how the model could serve, uh, it could be a model for the rest of the country in enhancing our forecasting? One of the areas that the Mesonet, first of all, let me back up from that and say, when we look at satellites, particularly those satellites that are in polar orbit, from pole to pole, that's really collecting global information that is extremely important for numerical weather prediction three, four, five days out. But when you're into the end game of a very intense situ situation, that's when the geostationary satellites and the mesonet really begin to play their role because they're giving you timely in situ information in the battle zone, in where the weather event is happening. And that's proven extremely valuable in Oklahoma. 
I should also mention there are many other benefits. Uh, we have something called OK Fire. It basically allows a farmer to come onto the mesonet and query with their zip code, can I burn the field today? Is it OK? And so the soil temperature information, the wind information, is allowing the people to make better decisions. Now, these are weather-related, but is an additional benefit to the predictive capability, particularly in that end game situation. And that information is available to everyone. Yes, it's on the web. And uh, I mean, this is something that when I moved to Oklahoma, I really didn't know about this. And all of a sudden, I thought, well, this is really important. It allows me to have in situ information all over the state. And this is something that we really need at the national scale. And as I also mentioned, we need to take that information into the lower part of the boundary, into the lower part of the boundary layer of the atmosphere to get that in situ information that is really needed for weather prediction as you get into an end game situation. To continue, Dr. Moore, I'm, of course, very proud to have introduced the Weather Act of 2017, which was signed into law a little more than a couple years ago to provide weather research and forecasting improvements, uh, weather satellite data innovation, to try and drive things forward in a coordinated fashion. In your experience, have the goals of the Weather Act been met? Tell us about the implementation. No, I don't think they have. Um, I think that this is going to be challenging. Uh, we have operated in a certain way uh, in terms of improving our models for a long time, and we are going to need to think afresh about how we do this. As I mentioned, I believe we have the greatest scientific talent in the, in the world, in the United States, in the area of meteorology. But it needs to be marshaled and applied to this national and global challenge. Uh, there are really many opportunities out there to allow this to happen, and I think the EPIC initiative is really at the, at the fundamental level. But there are other elements that are right teed up for this. For instance, cloud computing. This may be a whole new way in which teams can form around critical areas and involve the cloud in a, in a collaboration in terms of improving the models, because we've got to make that improvement. Speaking of that, and I address this to the whole panel, and we've all referenced EPIC several times, would anyone care to expand on how EPIC will help improve that, uh, that weather forecast, that skill when it comes to extreme weather? I'll let my colleagues speak. Absolutely. Yeah, I think one of the values of EPIC is the two-way interaction between the, the research and the operations. So, um, uh, it's critical for scientists to understand the, the forecast needs um, to enable the science to be relevant. So this continual iteration, this two-way flow, uh, can really accelerate and catalyze, catalyze the uh, research to operations. And, and I would just add to that, just like any good decision-making and problem-solving session, when you have more voices and ideas at the table, uh, you have more diversity of thought to challenges. And so I think by bringing the academic community and the best ideas from academia and other partners into the process of the American modeling system, you're just bringing more good ideas to the table. Well put, Dr. Shepard. you back the balance, or my time's expired, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. McNerney. Well, I thank the chair. I uh, thank the witnesses for your testimony. Very interesting and, and important. Uh, Dr. Doan, could you explain the difference between climate change and climate variability and how we see the climate change signal in our rising losses ap apart from climate variability? Yes. Um, so we know that extreme, extreme events have varied on different timescales throughout our history. So, for example, um, people have taken sediment cores along our coasts and along global coasts to look at the signatures of, in hurricanes. And they've varied on timescales of decades and hundreds of years, for example. Um, so what's different today? Well, um, we know that um, we are unable to replicate observed trends in extreme events without invoking uh, human influence in our model simulations. So we rerun we, we history with and without uh, human activities in our models or the impact of human activities. And it's, it's a clear signal that there's a, a human influence. Um, let me give you an, an analogy of uh, climate variability and climate change. So if you 
imagine a dog walker taking the dog for a walk across a park, the, um, the line traced out by the dog can be thought of as climate variability. But fundamentally, the, uh, the line trajectory by the dog walker is climate change. So climate variability fundamentally has to follow climate change uh, over a long enough uh, distance or time period. Well, would you uh, elaborate a bit on how risk management can be integrated with climate modeling? Yes. Um, yeah, my experience as a uh, Willis Research Fellow has shown me the value of, um, again, this uh, two-way understanding. So uh, I, I talk to um, risk managers to understand their key needs. For example, one of them, say, in um, California, is the need to understand these successive uh, atmospheric rivers or these winter storms in California. So I can go back to the data and pursue uh, uh, science discovery around that topic to try and improve our understanding of these sequences of events that will lead to better forecasts and better understanding of the overall risk. Thank you. Dr. Shipper, how does NCAR and NOA change forecasting for extreme events uh, such as 100-year flooding since we're entering a new era with changing climate? I think that's a, a very important question. I think that's a very important question because that's one of the messages that I often convey. Your your point about a new era is very important, and and what we saw with NOAA quietly, I, I would might add, a lot of people aren't familiar with the fact that they are updating the flood frequency and rainfall maps because we are seeing changes. I, I think what we what we need going forward, in addition to uh, systems like the EPIC, which you hear us all uh, mentioning because it is so important, we need to fundamentally understand sort of how our models, how our observations are framed to understand these extreme and compound extreme events. So for example, with Imelda just recently uh, in Texas, it was a tropical depression when it dumped three feet of rainfall, but that wasn't the full story. It wasn't just the tropical depression. There was also something in meteorology we call a trough that was just part of our large scale mid-latitude synoptic system that came into the um, state of Texas as well and sort of amplified the situation. And so although we saw one to two feet of rainfall potential out of Imelda, uh, it dumped three, in some cases, four feet of rain, close to four feet of rain. So uh, as NCAR, NOAA, and other colleagues start to develop models, there will be, need to be assessment of how we're representing the extreme end or the tail end of these extreme events. And I think that's, that's an area of, of needed research. Excellent. Would you comment on the accuracy of climate modeling? The accuracy. Of, I, I'm glad you asked that question because I come across people that often, you know, they're sort of stuck in this mode that the uh, climate models aren't accurate or they're, uh, they can't tell us anything about climate. And one of the big challenges I see is that people confuse weather and climate models. Uh, they're apples and oranges. Uh, a weather model is trying to depict the state of the atmosphere one, two, seven, ten, fourteen days out. Uh, a climate model is not trying to tell us what the atmosphere looks like on Wednesday at 2 p.m. in 2075. It's trying to predict the state of the climate system, and they do quite a good job because we now have a modeling system that represents the full Earth system. It represents the cryosphere, the atmosphere, the ocean, the land mass. We have evolved from a generation of models in the 60s, 70s, and 80s where there might have been some concern about the accuracy. Are there still uncertainties in the climate models? Absolutely. Uh, there's still some uncertainty about the atmospheric aerosols, the pollution and particles in the atmosphere. There's still some uncertainty about the representation of clouds in those models, but there's certainly enough information to make a, a, a decision. Uh, uh, uncertainty gets a bad rap. It, the uncertainty is not we don't know. It just means uncertainty. If I tell you there's an 80% chance of rain tomorrow, there's uncertainty in that information, but there's certainly enough information for you to grab an umbrella too. So in Dr. Doan's con um, analogy, you can kind of tell where the dog walker is going to go. I, I, I know the wiggles are going to be. In terms well, of the climate dog, I know where that dog's headed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do have um, a report submitted from Centerpoint Energy I'd like to get into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Um, I'm fascinated by a couple things. The mesonet system I was unaware of. Looks like there's 110 sites. Um, is this cellular based? Do we know? Dr. Moore, I guess that would be for you. You seem to know more. You see what I did there? Yeah. 
<laughs> set me up. <laughs> yes, it is, and uh, we actually uh, work with the uh, Oklahoma State Patrol and their communication system to make sure that we have very fast information. Every five minutes it's updated, and that information then is available to anyone who logs on to the, to the Internet system. And, and there is an app for it. Yes. Do you have that app on your phone? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Everyone does. Everyone does. I don't have it on my phone. <laughs> Come to Oklahoma. Come to Oklahoma. That's North Texas, we call that. <laughs> um, and Dr. Bostrom, you talked about uh, the need to invest in social and behavioral sciences. What do you mean by that? Um, there's a broad range of sciences that can help us understand both um, management opportunities and how people undertake management opportunities. For example, if we think about EPIC, there's a lot of inter interest in community modeling and how EPIC can advance what we know about modeling the atmosphere. But, we, but it's very obvious from the discussions around Ep EPIC that there are issues about how the community modeling itself should happen, what should be the procedures that guide it, and that kind of thing. And there's a lot of research that can help, ex help inform what kinds of processes or, or uh, methods for coordinating this could, could work better. There's also, of course, the obvious roles of, com of behavioral and social sciences in improving communications and improving our understanding of how people assess their risks and, and to act on them. That's a pretty tall order because I've lived on the Texas Gulf Coast in a 20-mile radius 66 years, 8 months, and 26 days. Who's counting? Uh, and I've been through a whole lot of hurricanes. And you see from Hurricane Ike, which most of y'all would recognize, and then also obviously Hurricane Harvey and, her, and Tropical Storm Imelda was ground zero uh, in mine and Dr. Babin's districts here in the last two years. And people don't take that serious when some, they say let's it's time to evacuate. And so we've got, if there's going to be some kind of certainty that you that we can come out with, how do you convince people a lot of people evacuated, for example, during Rita and, and uh, Katrina and some of the others, and the Houston highways were just absolutely inundated, pardon that use of the expression, and, and people couldn't get out. And there were several deaths on the highway, and they were run out of fuel and all kinds of stuff. And then a lot of them felt like they left needlessly. So how do you convince people through behavioral, social and behavioral sciences uh, that they can now trust our forecast? How do you how do you get to that point? There's evidence that people pay a lot of attention to warnings, and official warnings in particular, and that they're very important in, in influencing people's actions. People's actions are constrained not only by what they hear from the official warnings, but also by um, their own response opportunities, what they can afford. Their own experiences. Their own experiences as well, and, and what their neighbors are doing. There's all kinds of influences. So just being able to persuade people that they should evacuate is not the only thing that's going on. You mentioned that you study risk perception on page one in decision making. Yes. Who is, who is your target audience when you study that? Depends on the topic and the funding. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about storm decision making and evacuation and, yeah. and how much funding. So, so a storm decision making and evacuation, the, the only work that I've done on that has been in the, to in the context of flash flood and hurricane forecast and warning systems. And there we were looking, it was a National Science Foundation funded project. So our target was understanding what it was about the forecast and warning system where, uh, that might be improved and how it might be improved in terms of providing accessible and available information to the different parties in the system to be able to make good decisions. So that meant uh, looking both at emergency managers and what they need as also as how broadcasters get information and how they use it to talk to people. Sure, okay, well I need to move on. Just one more question for Dr. Shepard down here. Um, when you're talking about predicting weather patterns and currents and inside of storms you talked about, you couldn't get to the eye wall there, couldn't get into those things. How do you, with any degree of reliability, predict wind currents and what the, you know, the model airplane people call thermals, for example, stuff just came up from the earth. How do you predict those? Well, you know, the atmosphere is a, a, a dynamic and thermodynamic system with moist processes in it. So our models actually can identify thermals in those processes. But what I was talking about, those thermals, if you will, in the eye wall of the hurricane, uh, we can get information from the, the brave hurricane hunters that fly into those storms. Uh, there are satellite systems. I, I actually was the project science, deputy project scientist for one when I spent 12 years at NASA called the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, or GPM. It actually has a radar in space 
space, and so we can see something called hot towers, these bubbling thermals that you mentioned. And they provide clues that a lot of energy is being released in that hurricane, and we might see a, a strengthening of the storm. But the problem, here's the problem, that instrument is only on a polar orbiting satellite that only comes, it gets a snapshot of the storm every now and then. So we need a generation of technology that's giving us more robust spatial coverage, perhaps a geosynchronous radar or a, a network of cube or small stats. Okay, very quickly, I'm bad at time, but when you say it only gets a snapshot, those are orbit the Earth every three hours, six hours? So polar orbiting satellites are in low Earth orbit, whereas our geosynchronous satellites are at about 35,000 kilometers up. So they're just staring at the same spot on the Earth the entire time. So uh, a couple of times a day, perhaps, or may it just depends on the type of orbit the satellite is in. So we don't always have that information. We need, need more sustained information like that, and that's that's the, really the value of some of the advanced observation systems that NASA is looking at in its decadal survey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Bonamici. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our witnesses here today. I was pleased to work with Ranking Member Lucas on the Weather for Research and Forecasting Innovation Act of 2017, which, thank you for the acknowledgement, many of you took important steps to strengthen the capabilities and communication of weather forecasts. We know extreme weather events like Hurricane Dorian, for example, remind us of how important that legislation was, but also the value of the National Weather Service accurately and effectively communicating information. And if erroneous information is reported, it's the responsibility of the National Weather Service to refute it. That's exactly what the Birmingham office did earlier this month. And I know it's not the focus of today's hearing, but it's really important to acknowledge how those public servants help defend scientific integrity and what unfortunately became a political moment. Um, I want to follow up on Mr. Weber's question to Dr. Bostrom. During the legislative hearings on the Weather Research and Forecasting Innovation Act, we had extensive conversations about how forecasts will not adequately serve the needs of the public unless there are effective communication systems. The bill directed NOAA to do more research, to listen to experts, to improve its risk communications techniques. It is my understanding that progress has been made, but the pace has been slow. Um, in your testimony, I, I thought it was really compelling where you talked about in, in, with Sa uh, Sandy, 72% of the residents were in mandatory evacuation zones in New Jersey stayed in their homes, and sadly, 117 people died. Um, so this is a, this is a issue that affects human life as well as property. Um, there's always some uncertainty in forecasts, and we, we know that. So what research gaps still persist in our understanding of how forecasters can effectively communicate in light of the uh, uncertainty, and how can we better integrate social and behavioral sciences in the conversation about extreme weather events? Dr. Bostrom. Thank you for this question and for acknowledging the um, the importance of the Weather F uh, Research and Forecasting Innovation Act. It's really um, an important step forward, but as you said, progress has been slow, and while we have made progress in the social and behavioral sciences in this context over the last couple of decades, there's been very variable and limited funding devoted to this. We need research both on how the weather enterprise as a whole works. Right. So for example, if we think about what happened with Sandy, um, there are recent studies that have shown that people were paying a lot of attention, especially people in evacuation zones were paying a lot of attention to what was going on in various social media. Um, they get information from a lot of different sources, and they're also paying attention to the environmental cues that are going on around them. Further, as mentioned previously, they're paying attention to their previous experiences. So right. if they don't expect a storm as bad as what they've said, and as um, I believe it was uh, Dr. Shepard said, the storm surge is often the most dangerous. And we know from prior experience in the, in the research field as well that people don't anticipate the dangers of storm surge still. The storm surge products that have come out um, communicating storm surge are relatively recent, and people um, didn't anticipate that things would be as bad as they were. So we need to understand both how to use those communication systems better, how forecasters can work within the, uh, with these um, teams better to understand what emergency managers need. And we also need to understand better ways of communicating to people the dangers of storm surge and um, what those can bring. Thank you. Still some work to do. Um, Dr. Shepard, yesterday the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a special report on the ocean and cryosphere. 
In a changing climate, the report found that warming oceans and projected sea level rise will result in increasingly severe weather, uh, extreme weather events. And in your testimony, you discuss how disparities in income, social status, and other factors result in hurricane, flood, and heat waves having disproportionate and adverse effects on certain marginalized populations. We also know that extreme weather events differ based on geographical location. I mean, Mr. Mr. Lucas is in Oklahoma, and I'm in the Pacific Northwest. Um, in the Gulf, it might mean more hurricanes. In Northwest Oregon, it could be more intense marine heat waves, severe drought, wildfires, reduced um, snowpack. Um, so how can we more effectively assist our local communities in assessing the scientific uh, information they need to make informed decisions for, for resiliency planning, which is so critical? Thank you for that question. Um, I live in the South where we get every single type of extreme event. It's actually unique in that regard. We literally get every type. Coupled with that, if you look at the population base in the South, it tends to, particularly some of the Southern states, uh, tend to have low socio socioeconomic status in terms of the wealth gap that I've often talked about in some of my studies. And so that increases vulnerability when we have a heat wave or when we have a Hurricane Harvey. All you have to do is look at the, the faces staring at us uh, in the uh, Superdome during Hurricane Katrina. We, one of the things that we're doing at, in, uh, in the state of Georgia is we've uh, stood up through funding from the Ray C. Anderson Foundation, a stalwart of the business community, is something called the Georgia Climate Project. And that was called out in the National Climate Assessment as a potential best practice, a solutions-oriented effort to connect climate processes at local levels through businesses, through stakeholders, non-governmental organizations, and just regular people in their communities. Because there is a disconnect between all of this science jargon and mumbo jumbo that we talk about as scientists, and my aunt who lives in Canton, Georgia, or a great aunt who knows none of this terminology, but knows that they're experiencing events that uh, affect the cost of cereal they buy it or yeah. the price of gas when there's a hurricane plowing through the Gulf of Mexico. So we need to think about about, and something I want on the record, we need to think about these uh, communities in our country that um, are extremely vulnerable and at higher risk for these events. And I echo your thoughts on the National Weather Service, and I want to thank, as the former president of the American Meteorological Society, all of the men and women of the National Weather Service for what they do. Thank you. I see I, my time has expired. Th I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Babbitt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, and Ranking Member, I appreciate you. Thank you to the witnesses for being here today. I have the distinct privilege of representing Southeast Texas, but unfortunately that means that I'm far too familiar with these terrible storms and floods, and I continue to see these 2,000-year floods every two years. And uh, we've had two sweeping through my district in the past two years, almost two years ago to the date when Hurricane Harvey swept through southeast Texas, leaving a record rainfall in my district. Tropical Storm Imelda last week flooded the same Texans who were still recovering from Harvey. I've gotten calls from uh, constituents who just weeks ago uh, were finally able to move back into their homes when Imelda left them once more flooded uh, out. Uh, Dr. Moore. Uh, tropical Storm Imelda was upgraded from a typical rainmaker to a full-blown tropical storm, and many of my constituents were caught by surprise, including myself, uh, as these floodwaters rose. Can you talk about the threat of rapid intensification, which some of you have addressed already this morning, and sometimes just hours before landfall for hurricanes, and how forecasters take this into account? Just building upon what Marshall Shepard said earlier, uh, that we really had a very unique meteorological condition, and yet we should be able to address unique meteorological conditions. And we have seen a pattern of our models not catching the intensification accurately. We've done better on the landfall prediction but we don't seem to be catching the intensification, which is, after all, what really matters to those uh, in, in the landfall region. Uh, I think that this is, again, where observations, particularly observations that are contemporaneous with the storm, that, that is, observations that are uh, persistent, uh, is an absolute requirement. 
And I think that if we had had a sounder in geostationary orbit, we would have done better in catching the intensification. Uh, it really is a product of the, of the boundary layer in, in large measure. And I think that the fact that we have failed to catch this intensification has, has had a counterproductive uh, effect upon the body politic. People begin to say, well, it's uncertain, or it wasn't predicted. And that leads to inaction. And so the fact that our models have, have let us down at certain stages uh, should actually uh, cause us to be more uh, vigilant in terms of taking action. But if people will say, oh, well, I've been through this before, or there was this uncertainty, or the models are saying different things, and they use that as kind of a logic for inaction. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Sobel, uh, I would say it's fairly common to see headlines claim uh, that uh, hurricane-related inland rainfall and flooding has increased due to climate change. Uh, just earlier this month, the New, York Times, uh, the New York Times published an article that stated some attributes of storms, particularly uh, the increasing amount of rainfall associated with many of them, have reached a very strong consensus. Yes. Yet NOAA concluded an anthropogenic influence has not been formally detected for hurricane precipitation. WMO stated no ob observational studies have provided convincing evidence of a detectable anthropogenic influence specifically on hurricane-related precipitation. USNCA said there is a lack of supporting detectable anthropogenic contribution and observed tropical cyclone data. And to me, this seems like the very opposite of any type of consensus, yet alone a very strong one. In your opinion, why is the public discourse, including from scientists, often at odds with thorough assessments like the ones NOAA, and WMO, and others have published? Thank you for the question. Um, so I think it's important to understand the meaning of the word detect. I think that scientists in my field, and I include um, the, the many of the great experts at NOAA who write those statements, but all of us use a very conservative standard. So what detection means is, can you say with 95% confidence that the changes we've seen could not have occurred without human influence. That's a very strong standard. And some of the limitations in that are simply the observations. In other words, you have, a, you have numbers and intensities of hurricanes and rainfall that are fluctuating up and down year to year naturally. Any trends are slow upon that. The observations themselves have uh, limitations, as Dr. Moore has said, especially with rainfall, which isn't measured that well through all parts of the hurricane. So it's a question of, what, what those statements are saying is not that there aren't changes, but that they, you can't say, based on the observations with 95% confidence, that they couldn't have occurred naturally. But I don't think that's the right question to ask. So we know that the atmosphere has more water vapor. We know hurricanes are very good at squeezing that out. So from all sorts of evidence we have from our physical understanding and our models show pretty substantial increases of of uh, rainfall and hurricanes, the observations are not contradicting that. They're simply so noisy that you can't pull out that signal. So I, I like my example of people speaking quietly in a crowded room. It just, if it's loud, it doesn't mean, you know, you can't necessarily say with 95% confidence what they're saying, but that's not a reason not to take it seriously. So I think that's where the tension is um, between the, the very conservative standard that's used for detection versus our scientific understanding of what's actually happening. Thank you very much. My time has expired, which is unfortunate because I have other questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Kasten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much to our panelists. My, uh, my longtime friend, Mike McCracken, who was one of the co-authors of the IPCC report that shared the Nobel Prize with Al Gore, has been pointing out for some time in ways that are very troubling that the, the historic challenge with our climate forecasts is that they, they are prone to underpredict the severity of what happens because what we failed to always appreciate is all the complexity of the feedback loops and almost all the feedback loops are positive. Um, he was out here last week saying how it, 10 years ago we didn't think the Antarctic ice sheet was going to melt and, and now we see it melting and we have to start factoring that in. That leads to the reality that I think you all have well articulated, that extreme weather events are becoming more and more common. They are becoming more common than we need to. And I certainly thank you, Dr. Shepard, for articulating that climate forecasting and weather forecasting are two different things. But they connect in that extreme weather event moment. And uh, 
I was rather concerned when the Trump budget forecasts suggested we cut 110 employees from the national weather forecast. I raised those concerns to Dr. Jacobs when he was here, who assured me that the computers would be accurate. And you can imagine why, mm -hmm. given Mr. McCracken's comments, that makes me a little nervous. Dr. Bostrom, your research on the importance of, of humans that understand how humans communicate so that what we want to be heard will be accurately heard, I think is critical to making sure that we do that, because that's a hard thing to do on a computer. Notwithstanding all that, we have good people at the National Weather Forecast. We have really, really impressive models. They're really complicated. They're being adjusted in real time. All of, all of Mike's concerns are being integrated into the next model. And yet those models have to compete with a president with a Sharpie. And that's not a joke. Um, we have real people who are listening to that as well and trying to make decisions. And, you know, there's a reason why knowingly issuing a false weather forecast is a crime punishable by up to 90 days in jail. Dr. Shepard, can you please explain to the committee what the professional obligation is that exists for forecasters to correct the record when misleading weather information is causing unnecessary panic? And how do you balance that given the innate uncertainty to any forecast? Well, thank you for the question. And I, again, I, as, as someone that has sort of represented the broader meteorological community as the president of the American Meteorological Society, I, I have talked with virtually every uh, corner of this country in terms of the National Weather Service forecasters. If you look at the mission statement that they operate under, it is to protect lives and properties. Uh, I, I won't delve into sort of, sort of the political investigations or the political thought here, but I will say this very clearly the obligation to be clear about the current situation with the meteorological forecast for an extreme event like a Hurricane Harvey or Hurricane Dorian is of utmost importance. And I believe that's what the National Weather Service Birmingham forecasters were doing. And if that same situation arose again, they should do exactly the same thing. The second thing I believe is that by mixed messages, and we don't just see this in this particular situation, we as the meteorological community have an extreme challenge because there are all kinds of weather opinions and forecasts on social media and other places, and there always is this running joke as meteorologists, Mete meteorologists in the room know it, that it must be nice to work in a field where we're wrong half the time and still get paid. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a myth. We're actually wrong, uh, right most of the time, but uh, just like in football, if a field goal kicker misses an important field goal in the Super Bowl, people remember that even if he made all the field, uh, field goals all year long. That's the bias that we deal with and the myth. However, when we start questioning the expert forecast from the National Weather Service or the National Hurricane Center, that undermines and mm -hmm. In, in my opinion, jeopardizes safety of our, our public, or of our citizens, because if someone now starts to say, oh, I don't believe the National Hurricane Center forecast is, and that hurricane's headed my way, they may make a poor decision in terms of a decision. Thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm tight on time, but I want to get one last question into Dr. Bostrom. Can you, can you please share with us what the research shows about how people's trust in forecasts is impacted when they are confronted with false positives and how does that threaten public safety the next time we have an extreme weather event? I'm hesitant to speak without my data in front of me, but thank you for the question. Um, we know that trust is an, an essential component of any kind of communications process, especially with regard to risk. And we also know um, from the, in the context of tornado uh, for, uh, discussions and warnings in particular, when people get false warnings, it does um, cause a decrement to their, their behavior. So, um, but not as much as some people might expect. Um, that said, I don't think that we're talking about the kinds of situations in those research um, projects that we have here. Um, it is clear that uh, a false um, that false alarms do cause a decrement in behavior. Having uh, correct alarms is is uh, really important, and so the more correct alarms you have, the more you can offset those effects of, of false alarms. And ha and people are often very concerned about missed alarms. So um, that's a really important um, problem. I hope I've answered yep. your question. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Booney. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. And with uh, permission, I'd like to introduce three charts to go with my comment, if I might. Without objection. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Dunn and Dr. Shepard a question about the deep ocean heat content and the relationship of CO2 to that and uh, whether or not it's leading to stronger storms and what might happen if we can't arrest the rise in sea temperatures. This is a chart showing the rise in sea temperatures since uh, the early 
uh, 80s, uh, particularly the Western Atlantic, Western Pacific, and Gulf of Mexico. This is a chart showing the dramatic rise in the deep ocean heat content. And then this third one is one showing the same rise and breaking it out both above and below the 2300 meter uh, demarcation line. Thank you. Yeah, great, great question. Um, <clears throat> so we know from the data that much of the warming is going straight into the ocean um, by a large amount rather than warming up our atmosphere. And in fact, if, if, all, the, um, if all the warming uh, stayed in the atmosphere, our average global temperature would be many tens of Fahrenheit warmer than they are today. So um, <clears throat> there's huge changes to the heat, heat content in the ocean, and this has ramifications for extreme events. So we've talked, to, talked a lot today about hurricanes already. They feed off this uh, reservoir of energy, this fuel. So even just uh, a one degree increase in the ocean heat content, say in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, has vast impacts on the characteristics of uh, extreme events such as tropical cyclones and attendant flooding, for example. Uh, added to that, I mean, I think uh, your point is valid. One of the things that most people don't realize is most of the quote unquote global warming is happening in the oceans. That's about where 90 plus percent of the warming is going. We kind of quibble and argue about that small percentage in the atmosphere. But what I always tell my students at the University of Georgia is that heat in the ocean finds its way back to the atmosphere through hurricanes, through changes in weather patterns, something we haven't talked much about today. Uh, but just changes in the heating patterns in the Arctic region, uh, Arctic amplification, uh, that communicates to where we live, even if we don't live in the Arctic, and we live in Decula, Georgia, for example, the jet stream patterns that respond to those Arctic amplification changes, some of the uh, scientific studies suggest. So uh, your question about exactly that you're pointing to in your graphic there, uh, the thing to key to understand and why we need global observations is that the Earth system is a connected system. So something happening far off in the Arctic or in the Pacific Ocean can affect where we live. Thank you. Uh, if I might, one more question for Dr. Bostrom and uh, Dr. Sobel. Uh, coral reefs play a very important part of our uh, protection of shorelines as well as our ecosystems. And uh, science seems to be proving that stronger storms and ocean acidification are related. And so what I'd like to ask about is what can we do to reduce ocean acidification and to protect our coral reefs, and what is the correlation between ocean acidification and coral bleaching? Uh, I'm not an expert on, on corals, um, so I, I don't want to give too detailed of an answer, but I do understand from my colleagues who study them that, that they're in big trouble due to both warming and acidification of the oceans. I can't um, say the relative roles of both of those. But it's a very serious problem, and um, I don't know that there's anything that can be done to stop ocean acidification on a practical level other than putting less carbon into the atmosphere. The oceans are taking up uh, a large amount of that, and the, the ocean's so enormous that, um, you know, one can imagine geoengineering schemes to put something in the ocean to, to, to mitigate it, but I don't think those are practical. So... Um, so, and the same is true for the warming of the ocean. I really think uh, mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions is the, is the only answer there. Here's a picture of a bleached coral, dead. Anybody else have any thoughts about, about um, it? I would just um, echo what uh, Dr. Sobel said, that I'm not an expert in any of those things, but uh, it's very clear that the strategies that we have to mitigate what's going on with coral reefs and, and other um, potential living systems that help protect the coasts are, are, um, require reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the, and geoengineering strategies have been tested in the past um, with limited positive results as far as I understand. And we, we, are, um, we are in desperate need of new geoengineering strategies and research on them. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Fletcher. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for holding this hearing. And thank you to all the witnesses um, who are here testifying this morning. Your testimony um, is really interesting. And I'm sorry, I only have five minutes. Um, but I, I do want to follow up on a couple of things. Um, we've heard from my two neighbors, Dr. Babin and Mr. Weber. Uh, we all represent Southeast Texas, and I represent a portion of Houston. So these issues are near and dear to my heart and to my constituents who are still recovering from Hurricane Harvey, now from Imelda, and from 
four 500 year floods in five years. So we understand um, the remapping, the rainfall. Um, and I think that there are a couple of things that I would just love to hear your thoughts on and get you to touch on. In particular, um, I really liked in your prepared testimony and in your remarks this morning, um, Dr. Shepard, the conversation or the comments about how we're messaging and how we're talking about what the real impacts are. And for example, I just got a news report that in addition to the other things we know about Imelda, there were nearly 100,000 pounds of toxins released in the air from um, related incidents to the, to the rainstorm. So when you talked about how extreme weather affects our water supply, public health, infrastructure, energy systems, et cetera, I think it'd be useful to get your thoughts on, on kind of what those things are and how we can talk about those, that it isn't, while we all are concerned about some of the long-term effects, there are also immediate impacts that I think are useful to communicate. Sure, absolutely. I, I think it's, it's, it's critical. I think particularly if I were sitting in the shoes you all are sitting in because constituents resonate with how much they're paying for cereal or their gas prices or whether their, their child is vulnerable to a particular disease from a mosquito that couldn't live where they live now but can because of changing climate envelopes. So I, I just think, and I've written about this in a, an article I wrote in Forbes magazine about reframing climate not as this sort of esoteric or sort of very nebulous issue, but about kitchen table issues. And there are so many of them. There's a colleague that has, many of us are, I, not me, but many of us fly almost daily or fly on airplanes. There's uh, scientific research that suggests that there will be more turbulent flights uh, in a climate change environment. But the key point I often emphasize is there are things we can identify that are happening now, not 2080. These things are, uh, and, and the, the question earlier from your colleague in Southeast Texas, I think Adam handled it very well, uh, the, the question about sort of this notion of uncertainties and reports. I don't think those reports are saying that things aren't happening. I think it's just semantics. We ran into that a little bit with the American Meteorological Society as well in terms of a report we issued because as a scientist, we're, we're trained not to say things in absolutes. And I think we've, to, to our detriment to some degree, that's created some of the cloudiness, pun intended, in the discussion. Yes, I'm a lawyer and we also don't tend to speak in absolutes. Um, um, but uh, but I do think it's an important point. And going back to that, another another point you'd made, and I'd love to get anyone else's um, thoughts on this as well. So it's sort of open to the panel. But but the conversation about sort of climate change and whether humans have an impact seems to be a false choice. We know it's happening, and it has been happening, and we also know that we can have an impact. And so if anyone wants to weigh in on how we kind of navigate that messaging to say, especially um, for those of us, I think we have a lot of constituents who believe that it's happening, who see the effects, who want to understand um, that you don't have to choose between, there's not one scientific theory or another that they work together. So I don't know if Dr. Sobel, I know this is an area you research, maybe you can share your thoughts on that. An analogy that I find useful in this is um, we know that humans die of natural causes every day, many, many people, and this has occurred since there have been human beings. But that would be, uh, to say that humans die of natural causes would be a pretty weak defense in a murder trial. If I were accused of killing somebody, I, that wouldn't get me off. I would have to show why I didn't do it. And similarly, I think the climate has always changed for many reasons, but we are a big reason now, and we know that from many, many lines of evidence. So there's no inconsistency between those two things. Besides the, that analogy, there's many, many others one can come up with where there's multiple causes for things, but we know, you know the, what the cause is now. So I, I think, um, I, I don't know how, how to make the messaging better except to try to get that simple uh, concept across. And a point I often make is that trees fall naturally in the forest all of the time, but that doesn't mean chainsaws are hoaxes. <laughs> Um, that is a great analogy. I love analogies. I guess the last sort of question I would put out there is just what do you all think, and there's very little time, um, but what do you all think is the most important thing that our constituents need to know about how to prepare for a future with these more intense hurricanes? Yeah, uh, perhaps uh, rather ominously is that the, uh, the biggest signal is that the most intense events are changing the fastest. So the Category 4 5 hurricanes, evidence is building that we'll see more of them in the future. The heaviest rainfall events over Manhattan, for example, they're going to be uh, even worse in the future. So um, uh, with that understanding, I think it's time to act. Thank you very much. I see I've gone over my time, and I yield back. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Dr. Moore, um, 
as I'm sure we've discussed uh, already, uh, Hurricane Dorian, um, it was, as we all know, predicted to hit the east coast of Florida. Uh, I represent northeast Florida from Cape Canaveral up to, up to Jacksonville, three of the counties in my district, Volusia, Flagler, and St. John's, uh, went under a ma mandatory evacuation based on, based on the predictions. Obviously, Dorian never made landfall in Florida, uh, fortunately. Uh, this was a huge dilemma and hugely frustrating of when our county officials make those calls to evacuate. You don't wanna overreact, but obviously, uh, and, and, and to the tune of significant expenditures, but on the other hand, you don't want to underact. And obviously this is a call that we all have to collectively make every time one of these storms uh, uh, threaten the United States. So in this case, bottom line is we dodged, I don't say we dodged a bullet, we dodged a missile. Uh, the category five storm could have been absolutely catastrophic. And at one point, I think we were looking at Hurricane Andrew, Hurricane Michael and Hurricane Katrina maybe combined in terms of the original track. I know I personally was hitting the refresh button on the on, on the predictions, probably it seemed like about every five minutes. I think NOAA and the National Hurricane Center did as great a job and as good a job as it could informing the public um, every three hours. Uh, can you just take a moment to discuss the primary differences between the models that you use, the European model that we hear so much about and NOAA's? Are there any data points you would recommend NOAA include or weigh more heavily to improve the accuracy uh, of these models. It seems like in this case, the European model was pretty accurate. Uh, and if you could just talk to that for a moment, because there are, there are literally millions of lives and, and treasure that are, that are dependent. It's a great thing that we have it, but how would you, um, and what can we do to help improve it? Let me make three points. First of all, to the emergency managers that, and NOAA that had to make that call. Um, if anyone doubts why uh, we made the call, or that Noah made the call, look at what happened to the island offshore, where it did hit, and just project that damage into Florida. And if you had people in harm's way uh, and not being evacuated, it would have been a missile strike. It would have been a missile strike. Oh, absolutely, and just in the interest of time, I'm not questioning at all the calls that were made. How do we, you know, how do we, as we look forward, improve the accuracy of our modeling? I think what we have to also do is to look at how the Europeans uh, conduct their research. Uh, they marshal uh, the best talent across Europe, and they focus that talent really on one model. And they say, this is, this is where we're making our bet. Uh, we have tended to focus uh, our talent across many models. And at the same time, we have only used a portion of our scientific talent. Uh, in particular, the university community has not been in a position to be as engaged uh, in the development of the next generation of numerical weather prediction. And I hope with the EPIC initiative, and we thank Congress for this, and with the Innovation Act, that there is a recognition that the total United States scientific community, from the social scientists to the physical scientists, have got to be engaged in this grand enterprise. Thank you very much, and I appreciate, I appreciate that answer. Uh, again, in the, in the few minutes I have remaining, and this is for anyone on the panel, uh, Florida and Florida's governor is, I think, leading the way in many ways in naming a chief science officer and naming a chief resiliency officer and trying to look at uh, how we mitigate, uh, and, but then also how do we respond once we sustain that type of damage and do we rebuild in smarter ways and more resilient ways uh, than, we, than we have in the past. Uh, it, would, would anyone care either for the time I have remaining or I'd appreciate it for the record of uh, how we can be more resilient. I think Florida is leading the way post Hurricane Andrew and wind resiliency. And we need to look at that in terms of flood resiliency with rising seas, with insurance markets, with property valuations. This is critical to the future of our state and, I, and, and the country. And in the few seconds I have remaining, any, any responses, please? 
I'll jump on it, but I think James has some thoughts as well. Um, at the University of Georgia, we stood up an institute for infra uh, resilient infrastructure systems where we're thinking exactly about those because there is a research by um, Phil Kutzba and I, I believe in Roger Pilkey Jr. and others that have shown the infrastructure along coastal regions has increased at the same time we're seeing these extreme events. So there has to be a sustained thought process for thinking about resilience and risk for our infrastructure in these regions. Yeah, just to uh, build on that, uh, just briefly, some, some work I did with my colleagues showed that um, the Florida Building Code is extremely effective against hurricane wind damage. Um, and that's due to the strength of the code and how well it's enforced. And so uh, building that out uh, nationwide would presumably bring similar benefits. Thank you, and I welcome any other responses for the record. I think this is an incredibly useful conversation. W water resiliency, too, and not just wind. Absolutely. Wa water yeah. gets underplayed, not just the surge, right. the rainfall. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamb. And thank you to all the witnesses for coming. I, I'm sort of picking up where you left off, Dr. Shepard, because um, intense rainfall in short bursts has uh, really increased in Western Pennsylvania where I represent in the last couple of years. July 2018 was the wettest month on record uh, for us and many of the people that I represent live at the bottom of the big hillsides that line our rivers where we are. And many of these are old mill or manufacturing towns. That's why they were located there in the first place. Um, and so these are middle class communities. I walked through a woman's home this summer who was born in that house and she bought it from her parents and is in her 60s now and has just watched it flood every single summer for the last few years. Because as Dr. Dunn so hopefully or so helpfully pointed out in his written testimony, Pittsburgh has not really changed its stormwater infrastructure in the last uh, century. We have failed to keep up. Uh, I place a lot of the blame for that at the national level and our inability to work together on an infrastructure package that actually meets the challenges of the modern day. Um, so that's something we're not going to give up on and we're going to keep working on. But I would like uh, maybe if a couple of you could delve into the details of the scientific consensus that these intense rainstorms um, are caused by climate change and by global warming. Uh, you know, sort of the average person on the street in Pittsburgh can tell that they're happening more frequently than they ever happened before. Um, I have an Aunt Patsy who's 99 years old and lived at the bottom of one of those hills for a long time and she's remarked at how different it is now. Um, but, you know, you, Dr. Doan, I think it was referred in your testimony to a fundamental scientific principle that moisture in the atmosphere is increasing uh, for every degree of warming. Uh, but I think what would help me would be if you could describe how sure are we. You know, I've, I've heard it said, for example, that the scientific consensus on man man anthropogenic climate change is now roughly equivalent to the scientific consensus on gravity. Um, so is there another analogy like that can, that can help me communicate to my constituents how sure we are the cause of these rainstorms and the flooding that comes with them? Um, yeah, there's a, as scientists, we look at two main drivers of um, extreme events. We look at so-called thermodynamic drivers, which is changes in uh, heat and uh, moisture. And then we look at changes in the circulation, so the changes in the weather patterns. And so um, we, we like to separate those two, and we're very uh, confident in changes to the, to the heat and the, uh, the moisture, or changes due to those increases. We're, we're less sure on um, changes in extreme events due to circulation. Um, so when I'm talking about um, changes in extreme precipitation in the Northeast, for example, I tend to talk about uh, changes in frequency of weather patterns, you know, changes in high pressure weather patterns or troughs of the eastern US and, and talk about changes in the frequency of those different distributions. It seems to be an effective way of uh, communicating extremes. Sure. And I, I would say, say that the report that Adam and I both worked on for the National Academies, uh, we ranked our confidence in changes in extreme events and top one, two percent rain events, we were very confident in the notion that they're coupled to climate change. Adam? Yeah, I, the, the influence of warming on extreme rain, rain events is not quite at the level of gravity, but it's getting closer. It's getting I mean, the, 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 the rule that we used in the report that uh, Dr. Shepard just mentioned is that the more s closely any given type of event is related to temperature, the more we, the better we understand it. And extreme rain events, so heat, that's why heat is the simplest, but 
extreme rain events are the next simplest because the water vapor in the air is so closely related to temperature. The other thing I want to say here that's uh, important to understand is that we have several ways of knowing what's happening in the atmosphere. One is the observations. The other is understanding the physics, and the third is the models that we use to predict climate and weather. And in the case of extreme rain events, they're all giving the same answer, at least in direction. So the, the, we understand there's more water vapor in the air, and the extreme rain events are the ones that are really good at squeezing that out. And so the way they change is closely coupled to the amount of water vapor in the air and thus to the warming. The models also predict they should be getting heavier uniformly. And we can see it in the observations. If we look at all extreme rain I'm going to cut you off there just because there was one last thing I wanted to get in before my sure. time expires, but thank you. Um, Dr. Doan, I think your, your work on the building codes in Florida is, is great, and I'd like to see more of it for different uses in parts of the country. Um, it, it comes to mind for me that those two pictures you put in your testimony of Pittsburgh, uh, the implication is the infrastructure hasn't changed. There's one way in which the infrastructure did change in that time period you're talking about, which is that uh, in the 30s and 40s, America built a series of dams, locks and dams. Um, but one of the dams in particular uh, was a direct reaction to the flood of downtown Pittsburgh, the same place you have the picture of in 1936. Um, and that dam cost roughly in today's dollars around $5 million to build. And there have been estimates that it's probably prevented over $500 million of flood-related damages that come from when you flood a downtown of a major city. And so is there, is there more work like what you've been doing that we could do from the government or from the National Science Foundation or otherwise? Can you just give me a little bit of insight into that? Yeah, that's a very important point. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, Building dams is building uh, resistance to extreme precipitation events. Um, I think there's a lot, a lot to uh, pursue in terms of building uh, safe-to-fail infrastructure. So this would allow communities to absorb some of the event. So rather than building a wall or a dam higher and higher and higher, because there's always going to be a worse extreme, I think it's um, vital to now we're in a new era of uh, changing extremes to um, absorb this notion of what we call graceful failure. So we, where we absorb some of the shock, but we can get back on our feet very quickly. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing today on forecasting and communicating extreme weather. I assure you it's very important uh, to the citizens of Florida because it saves lives. In 2004 and 2005, uh, Florida was hit by a series of severe hurricanes, about five of them, I believe, uh, which uh, caused damage in every single county. All 68 counties uh, were damaged, um, most of them pretty, pretty significantly. The insurance companies obviously went ballistic almost immediately and, and doubled or tripled everybody's rates. Uh, because the reinsurers did the same thing. And we started um, getting copies of their gloom and doom forecast for the future, that it would only get worse the next year and progressively and progressively and progressively, and uh, surely that in just a few years there would be no insurance left for anybody or uh, there would no, be no one who could afford the insurance. And the state lawmakers were concerned by that, so they hired their own uh, actuaries, their own uh, data study people, and uh, the result was even worse than the insurance companies had told us, so it was pretty bad. Uh, we received one unsolicited uh, suggestion and an analysis from a fellow named Dilly, a retired uh, forecaster with the National Weather Service. Any of you ever heard of him? Just shake your head if you haven't heard of him before. And, and after he retired, he started uh, tracking severe weather as a hobby. And, and so rather than go uh, review the statistical maps and timelines um, and, and take a statistical approach to the whole thing, he focused on uh, way upper weather patterns. And, and Mr. Dilly told us, he said, I only go uh, eight years out with my forecast. But he said, I think you guys are good to go for about eight years uh, before you're going to have another severe uh, hurricane hit Florida. 
and, and you may have a little action in the southwest part of the state, but it, but it won't be severe. Most people laughed at this guy, uh, but history proved that uh, he was right on the money. And so I'd, I'd, I'd like to know if, if, if you're familiar with his type of analyses, uh, who does it, uh, or other thoughts that you might have on it, and we might start with Mrs. Bostrom. Well, that is way out of my bailiwick. <laughs> but, but I'd like to, um, uh, something came to mind while you were talking, and that was the um, predictions of earthquakes. But you can uh, sometimes be right about something, even if the method that you're using isn't terribly good. So um, I, I would really need to know a lot more um, and otherwise conclude that this was a coincidence that he was correct. Yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing. You know, a, bloke, a broken clock is right twice, a, uh, twice I guess, in a day. And so, uh, I, you know, well, I, I he, he wasn't right once. He was right eight times, and everybody else was wrong eight I, times. Sure, I mean, those, then that's still a small n eight. So, uh, what what I tend to sort of look at when I look at these sort of because in, as meteorologists, we hear all kinds of things about rodents that predict the weather and almanacs. Um, but I, I tend to go with the sort of peer reviewed literature. Now, I would certainly would love. I would love to see his methodologies published, and I think that's what the peer review literature is for. So if Mr. Dilley's listening out there, I would invite him to sort of publish that methodology so it can be evaluated, because he may be on to something. I, I, I would just suggest that I, I wouldn't want the National Weather Service and colleagues to uh, sort of change their overarching principles and methods based on a sample of eight. I'm not suggesting that. Just curious if anybody yep. else has heard of that and, no. and what your thoughts about it are. No, honestly Dr. Moore? not. Anybody else have any thoughts about it? Nobody else thinks it's worth investigating? I don't know this fellow's method, but we could talk about the reinsurance rates in, in Florida at the, at, after 2005, if that's of interest. The, um, there is a, you know, the, the, the reinsurance rates are influenced by a lot of things, and it is true that, that there's market forces, so there's an emotional response either to an event that just happened or a sequence of no events. So the rates go up a lot if there's a bunch of bad events, and they go down if there haven't been any for a while in a way that probably fluctuates more than it should. The risk is sort of a, a slowly changing thing, but how often the risk is realized is, is, a, is a different thing. So you have car insurance, but you're not going to crash your car every day. Re so, Reinsurance so, yeah. is different in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Number but, one, they're all housed in the same offshore island. <laughs> and they all change the same rate, charge the same rate, and change the rates at the same time. We'd call that a monopoly if they were on the mainland. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I see my time's expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Foster. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thanks to our witnesses, and and my apologies for having been in and out of this um, hearing. Um, one of the things I'm hearing a lot of excitement about from uh, the computational physicist at Argonne Lab that I represent is is the impact of artificial intelligence on things like dynamic mesh reconfiguration and getting effective models of, at small scales that are applicable to large scale modeling. And they believe that in some applications that may buy more than a factor of 10 and maybe 100 in the amount of a bang for your buck for a given level of computational power. And is that also happening in the weather prediction regime? And is there any way to quantify, you know, is that going to buy us one or two days of additional forecast accuracy or, or something along those lines? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's a, a great method methodology. Um, yeah, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, we've uh, engaged with this so-called mesh refinement technique with the weather research and forecasting model. So we have about a decade of experience in real-time forecasts of, in hurricanes. <clears throat> now, the key point is that this um, the ver they're computationally cheap, and so we can run run it more than once. We can run, say, an ensemble of 50. So this allows us to um, <clears throat> really describe and draw out the future possible scenarios to enable more robust um, responses. Yeah, do you have any, any estimate at this point of what that's going to buy in terms of, of accuracy? Um, you know, because you, you sort of hit this chaotic wall at a, at a, a week or two. Um, and, and I was wondering, does this allow you to push closer to the chaotic wall, or does the chaotic wall so sharp that, um, that even these techniques aren't going to make things better? Yeah, Dr. Uh, uh, the chaotic wall is there uh, irregardless, but what this allows you to, to get at is the so-called convective resolving models, so that the models 
actually can begin to resolve clouds and convective, particularly the third dimensional motion of the atmosphere. And that is extremely important in any type of numerical weather prediction. The work that is being done at Argonne really is first rate in getting us towards the capability of doing convective resolving. And then you can begin to assimilate satellite data at these higher spatial temporal resolutions to further tamp down the chaotic aspect. Mm -hmm. no, satellite so observations the, in some sense always draw us back to truth. And then at the end of the rainbow is, you know, the concept of being able to actually steer uh, hurricanes. And, you know, about a decade ago, Bill Gates had this patent that got a certain amount of press that, um, you know, with a relatively small change to the surface temperature of water, the thought was you could either suppress or steer hurricanes. And has that been looked at and modeled by anyone? Is it completely hopeless? Or, is, or if you could do something relatively minor, can you actually steer hurricanes? I don't think you can do anything with something minor. Hurricanes are very enormous and have a huge amount of energy. So uh, steering, I don't think, is practical. What could well, be done... Yeah, what I was thinking of is if you're near a disturbance yeah. near the, the chaotic wall would yeah. have a very high impact if you could calculate what that impact would be, you know, the, the butterfly. Oh, so you're not talking about actually changing the path of the storm but just predicting it? Um, well, if you could predict it accurately and predict the effect of a small perturbation early in the development of the storm, right. conceivably that would have a large impact on the trajectory. Yeah, I mean, it may be physically possible. My guess would be that you still take a huge amount of energy to do it. What I think is more better understood, and I, what I think the Gates project was getting at was changing the intensity, which if you can cool the, the ocean the surface, surface enough, right. you, you could do that, but it's still would take, you'd have to do that over a very, very large scale and, um, and have to operationalize it very quickly as the hurricane develops. So my sense is that the, the, the cost it would take to do that would be better spent on measures to protect life and property and, and get people out of harm's way, but that's... Yeah. Well, I was wondering if something that can be done very early in the development may have a very large lever arm to affect the course. Um, and, you know, things like, I don't know, seeding clouds and stuff that I guess is sort of well understood and pretty minor might be able to, uh, you know, if it's done two weeks in advance, actually um, actually have a noticeable and useful effect. Anyway, if there's any, any work that's been done, and that would be fascinating to read myself to sleep with it um, when, it's, uh, when it's possible, because it, it's not obviously from first principles impossible. Um, Let's see, and I have now 15 seconds yet, yeah, so I, I have no 15 second questions left, so I'll yield back. Great. The, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of our witnesses for uh, testifying today. Uh, I have long been, uh, on this committee, uh, have been uh, concerned about staffing at the National Weather Service and uh, the administration proposed to eliminate 20 percent of the forecasters and close some of the offices on nights and weekends has been uh, very concerning uh, to me. Um, I want to ask a question. I know no one is here from the National Weather Service, but uh, I just wanted to ask this question to see if anyone had uh, experience or comments on this. I know after uh, major storm events that lead to uh, major economic impact and fatalities at National Weather Service employees are called in to evaluate response performance. So I'm curious if any of the, uh, the witnesses on our panel have reviewed these service assessments and used them in your research efforts, particularly as you evaluate impacts and responses to extreme weather events. And if so, have you noted any impact from the understaffing that impedes National Weather Service's ability to respond during extreme weather events? Does anyone have any? Dr. Shepard? I, I haven't done research in that, but I, I will say that I, I, it, it's important that our, our National Weather Service offices are fully staffed, particularly in these extreme events or these sort of long-term sustained events. I, I, I've heard stories of, of National Weather Service employees uh, during shutdowns or sequestrations and things like that, slogging the work in snow and those types of things, and those aren't hyperbole. They, those things happen. Um, I wrote an article once about the sort of psychological fatigue uh, 
uh, and the sort of mental aspects that meteorologists uh, deal with uh, in these offices. Um, you know, the, the first responders, uh, uh, kudos to them and thank them for what they do in the emergency response, but oftentimes in, uh, meteorologists carry a burden because they are forecasting and predicting events that are going to change people's lives, and that's a, that's a tough sort of psychological burden. So I say all of that, all of that to say that, I, I, I again, I've not done research. I don't know if anyone has, but I would always advocate that our National Weather Service offices are never cut in terms of staffing. In fact, if anything, they probably need to be upgraded because they've been short-staffed in some regards. I know my friend Louis Uccellini at the National Weather Service uh, has, has tried to be responsive to this and their pressures and forces beyond his control, but those offices need to be fully staffed. Let me just mention, we've been critical of, of uh, the numerical weather prediction capability of our models and so forth. Uh, but that should not extend into being critical of the National Weather Service, uh, per se. The, uh, the work that they do, and in particular, I remember at, um, the Storm Prediction Center at, at the University of Oklahoma National Weather Center talking about uh, a tornadic outbreak uh, in the Illinois, Indiana area uh, in November. And they were speaking about it 10 days out. And eventually we got into the end game and there was a tornadic event, but by that time FEMA had facilities on the ground, the body politic was prepared. And really the, the fact of what we're able to do in terms of weather prediction and protection for our society is really extraordinary. It really is one of the grand accomplishments of science. Hey, Dr. Bostrom? Yes, I'd like to echo what Dr. Moore said and also what Dr. Shepard said, that the National Weather Service does an enormous uh, service to the country and protecting people. And there are have been in the testimonies earlier this year from Dr. Uccellini and others um, examples of how the Weather Service has been able to provide information that has equipped emergency managers to help their communities. They, uh, um, Fedra Daifa has written um, some research that is ethnographic that looks at what goes on in weather, in weather service um, offices, and, and you can see from that that they're overtaxed, that they're under-equipped under and under, uh, understaffed, and they work really hard to cover their jobs and are doing the best they can. Um, and it's a, and the, her, her work is a call for better staffing at the National Weather Service, and Dr. Uccellini and others have tried very hard to make sure that this staffing has improved. Um, they've made some progress, but as you can tell, it's an uphill slog. Um, I have not done research on the, the service assessments, but they're an very, a, a, a really important contribution in terms of providing feedback on how this all works. And, and it's been clear from the service assessments that have been done that there, is, there are a lot of things that need to be improved about how the whole system works. That does not mean that people are not doing their jobs. They're doing an excellent job. Thank you. And uh, I don't really have time for a question. But I just wanted to point out the uh, uh, recent assessment of impacts of climate change on the Great Lakes uh, put out by the Environment, so, uh, Environmental Policy and Law Center. Um, and this is something... The, uh, that uh, I think really brought a lot of attention to the impacts in, in the Midwest. I don't have time right now to ask about that, but uh, maybe in follow-up uh, I will ask you all about that. But uh, thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. And the Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. Wexton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the panelists for coming and joining us today. Um, the frequency and severity of extreme weather is clearly something that's of interest to everybody on this committee. Uh, I don't think there's a single one of us who, who our district has not been impacted in some way. And my home, as the chairman stated, is in Virginia, where we have seen uh, increased inland and coastal flooding, more days with a heat index above 105 degrees, and lots of these extreme rainfall events uh, that have caused a great deal of damage to roads and infrastructure. And in fact, in the lead up to um, Hurricane Florence, almost a quarter million Virginians were ordered to be evacuated from low-lying flood-prone pr prone areas throughout the Commonwealth. So we rely as a state and our localities as well rely on NOAA and the National Weather Service to help them make informed decisions about when the public safety is at risk. So I would ask of everybody on the panel, how important is it for the Weather Service to be federally funded, readily available to the public, and completely separate from private interests. Dr. Shepard. Uh, 
I, I think this is a, an area where we've come a long way in the weather enterprise. I'm speaking sort of on behalf of the weather enterprise. Um, there was, a, I would say, a tension between the sort of public-private partnership. Uh, but I think we found our rhythm. I think there are very clear roles for both the private sector and the public sector in this partnership. Uh, I, I would, uh, and I think the, the recent weather legislation has sort of um, provided other opportunities for the private sector to kind of get into this. Uh, I still view uh, many of the services provided by the National Weather Service as sort of what I consider like police and fire services, sort of uh, federally uh, sort of designated services that we need irrespective of profit margins, irrespective of other things, uh, because uh, they provide very critical information. But I think in terms of the value added services, some of the nimbleness and some of the observations, I think there's a, a, it is a role for the private sector as well. But I think some core services certainly need to be maintained. I think EPIC is providing a nice model for us, though, of how the public private partnership can work. Yeah, I'd like to um, speak to the value of uh, sustained National Weather Service uh, s staffing. There's a, there's, through decades of um, observing weather, you can really understand and get some unique intelligence on how the weather works. So I'll give a quick example that happened just two weeks ago over Northern California. There was a, an outbreak of so-called dry thunderstorms. So we've spoken a lot today about uh, the advances we've seen in, in our simulation capacity, but these kind of events, they don't exist in our, um, in our weather prediction models. So it's only through experience that the forecasters could see the weather pattern. They know that there's a risk of these uh, so-called dry thunderstorms and the lightning that can trigger or raise fire risk. So this speaks to the, um, the importance of a sustained staffing of the weather service. Okay, before we go down the rest of the panel, I just want to express to you a concern that I have. Uh, because the gentleman who has been tapped to lead NOAA, Barry Myers, has previously advocated for NOAA to restrict the amount of weather information that is provided to the public. Uh, and he, uncoincidentally, is one of them, or at least was one of the majority shareholders in a private company, uh, AccuWeather. And even though they get all of their information from the National Weather Service and NOAA, they then want to sell it back to, to the American public uh, at a profit and I, I mean, there's an inherent conflict of interest in there in my mind. So I guess, you know, building on my, uh, my earlier question, do you see potential conflicts when, uh, when you have a private industry uh, who is restricting the uh, information that's getting out to the public in weather? Dr. Sobel? Um. So I think the private sector has an important role to play, but as Dr. Shepard said, and as I think you're um, alluding to, the federal government does the core work to make the weather forecast possible, launches the balloons and runs the satellites and, and runs the models. The private sector is doing value added on top of that. So um, there, it is like police and fire. There should be a public weather forecast available to everyone done by the, the, the government employees and the private sector has a tremendous role and is doing very well mm -hmm. adding value to that. And so I think the way it's been done historically has been, has been working, has been evolving in a, in a way, but we should keep the, the National Weather Service strong and making public forecasts as it has been. And I have, no, I have no qualms with the private sector adding value to that work which is provided by the National Weather Service and NOAA. What my, my issue is restricting yep. the information that is readily available to the public for the for the purposes of getting a profit. I so. completely share your concern. There. Yeah, and the taxpayers pay for the pay for this these services. I, I will just say that without commenting on any specific person or their thoughts or companies, but um, you, you know, I often remind people that the satellites and the weather models were paid for with their taxes. And by the way, the National Weather Service fund is funded on about the cost of a cup of coffee for every American citizen. So it's one of the biggest values in the federal government. It certainly is, and on that note, uh, I don't think we can improve on that testimony, and I see my time has expired, so I'll yield back. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Wexton. I now yield five minutes to myself for questions. Um, I'd like to just begin by thanking you very much for making an extraordinarily powerful case for the urgent need for all of us to address climate change and in any way that we can, which leads me inevitably to conversations about carbon pricing because I think most of us would agree, uh, you know, every economist across the political spectrum, uh, from very conservative, very liberal, thinks that we should price the things we don't want as high as we can and the things we don't want as low as we can. 
Uh, in fact, it's been very bipartisan. Francis Rooney, who asked some great questions earlier, is a lead sponsor of a carbon pricing bill. Carlos Cabello, um, recently of this body, ha have made, led that effort significantly. And we have all these corporations, ExxonMobil, BP, I think Chevron or Shell. Um, you know, the, the world is coming together on it. But my sense is that this Congress won't take up a carbon pricing bill because it is, we're not going to get anywhere in the Senate with it. And we still have some political, actually partisan resistance. So I want to go back to, to the NOAA estimate from earlier this year that we had $91 billion in damages in 2018 from extreme weather events and $306 billion in the U.S. from extreme weather events. Um, when you put all those together, doesn't it sound like we have a hell of a carbon price, a carbon fee anyway? Dr. Doan? Absolutely, that's a very, very important point. Uh, we're already paying for climate change through, through our losses. And in fact, uh, I know um, through my conversations with the reinsurance in industry that they can see the, um, the footprint of climate change in their loss data. So um, <clears throat> climate change is becoming central to everything, well, much of what the uh, reinsurance industry does. Um, they, they've realized they can no longer look backwards if they want to assess today's risks. They must also look forwards and that demands uh, scientific understanding of what's tomorrow, 10 years, 50 years from now. It, to, to that exact thing, Zurich Insurance came to see me and, and my wonderful staff recently to make exactly that case. That as they look at how much reserves they have to have down the road, please do something about climate and start with carbon pricing. Dr. Shepard, the compound extreme weather events, you've talked about that you guys a little bit, the notion that uh, you know, the hurricanes followed by the flood, the wildfire, the heat is followed by the wildfire. Um, can you talk about how difficult it is, what progress we can make in terms of predicting the compound weather events? So it's a conversation we were having earlier. Thank you for the question. I, I, I think that there's inherently nothing different about the model's ability to handle a singular event from a compounded event. But as we were talking earlier, uh, those secondary events, the complexities of those, how they may be resolved. I think uh, Professor Moore has been talking about these. There may be some secondary events that are not as well resolved that are underplayed. We just saw that, for example, with Amelda, uh, and in terms of that trough, that mid-latitude non-tropical system um, sort of suffering some. So I think if there are one area that, uh, among many actually, that I would recommend uh, further study, research funding, et cetera, through National Science Foundation, NOAA, NASA, or others, is in understanding how our modeling capabilities are addressing these multiple compound events, because I think this is an emerging area of study. I know Professor Sobel mentioned that there is some work in a workshop recently that has been held, but I think this is fertile ground for new research. Yeah, thank you. And Dr. Bustrom, Dr. Doan had talked about the, the difficulty of attribution, especially when you look at so much, uh, you know, uh, impervious surfaces everywhere, the urbanization of the world, uh, growing population, seven billion. Uh, how do we tease out the climate change signal from the other factors that are affecting the extreme weather events and, and the impacts of the extreme weather events? Um, as in any scientific problem, what we t try to do is come up with counterfactuals and then um, figure out what the specific at, um, attribution can be for any specific factor that's driving a change like climate change. So um, the, it, as everybody's been talking about, we have models of what's driving specific damages, what's driving specific hazards, and in those models, we're generally using simulation models to try to f find out what we can attribute to a specific um, event. That's hard to talk about. <laughs> Um, and and uh, so I think the easiest thing for, for people to understand is that um, to tell them, uh, to show them examples where um, they, they wouldn't have seen the same kind of damage or the same time of type of effect without the specific fingerprint or, or uh, thumbprint of climate change. Great, great. Thank you all very much. Um, we have been abandoned by the other members of Congress um, who are all uh, doing, doing the people's work. So I just want to thank you very much. And thanks, thank you for all that you do in your professional lives to keep us safe, to work on our economic and our personal security. We're, we're very, very grateful for the work that you do. And thanks for being here today. Uh, it's often uh, an anxious event, appearing before uh, all the mean people on these dais. But uh, you survived it very well.
The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from members and for any additional questions that committee members may have for you. Uh, so with that, um, the witnesses are excused. The hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, really yeah, good thanks. job. That was awesome. Yeah, good. Thank you, sir. Well, now we should figure out. There's going to be something coming out of the future legislation. I, can't uh, yeah. I think they're looking to put a bill in to target what you guys remember the I'll attribution of the yeah. weather. Okay. Nice. That's the bill is going to be called Legacy, is what I'm understanding. <laughs> I don't know what it means. Well done, sir. Yeah, thank you. Survive. Yeah.